All right, everybody, you guys ready to jump into God's Word? I've been waiting a month to do this, so come on. Let's do it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Awesome. Why don't we open up our Bibles? We're going we're gonna to close up our series tonight, Red Wall, Red Letter. I want to take a moment. I want to thank Pastor Jay. He's not here tonight. Um, Jay and Marty, aren't they just awesome? Just love them so very much. Best people. Jay is such a faithful, faithful pastor. Loves you. Marty is amazing. Um, I know he, he preached, preached well. Still got some fire in his belly, 73 years old. Uh, just a wonderful man of God. I want to thank John Abner and, and David Braham for coming over and sharing God's word with you. Two faithful, awesome friends of mine. They love the Lord. They love the word of God. They love the people of God. And, uh, and I love them. And they did a great job. I got to watch their stuff online, and so I was blessed by that. But I'm excited to be back. You know, absence does uh, make the heart grow fonder, and uh, ministry can be difficult. Even though everyone thinks you only work on Sundays, it's not true, and um, sometimes it gets a little bit heavy, and so you just need to kind of get away. And Pastor Ramon and Pastor Jay were really kind. Uh, just over a month ago, I was going to see if I could take a couple weeks off, and Jay put his pencil down. When Jay puts his pencil down, you should just listen. He put his pencil down and he said, Hey, well, Pastor, when was the last time you just like took off for a month and just did nothing? And I said, um, Never. And he said, Well, why don't you do that? And I don't even think I asked, Really? I think I just took my stuff and left. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but they were just really kind. They said, We got this. And um, I've gone away before for a shorter period of time, and it didn't, I didn't come back to a healthy church. But I think, that, I think that I have this time, big time, and I'm very, very thankful for those guys and everybody else who are alongside of them to help keep the ship going. I'm just one person, just an un, unworthy servant doing his duty, and uh, all of us together, we're a family, and we're here to uh, serve the Lord and minister to Him and to bless people, and so I think we've done that over the last month. But I'm excited to be back and, uh, and to share God's Word with you. And, um, I, you know, I, I'm fighting this, but I think I might need to put on my glasses full time here. This is, I thought I was going to be okay when I got up here. I'm not really that okay. I think I need, yeah, I know. It was my 50th birthday. Yeah. Yeah. This is terrible. Well, these are cheaters, but they're, it's kind of weird when you wear cheaters, though, because, like, you can see really well here, but then I look at you and I can't see you. So, which may be good, because some of you might be making faces. I mean, I know Carl is, and so it might help me from getting laughing too hard. But anyway, open up your Bibles. Uh, every time you come to Revolution Church, you want to hear that. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to finish out this series, Jesus Christ getting up on the mountain and, and, and teaching His disciples uh, how to live the Christian life. And so as you're turning there, I just want to say that I am very, very much aware that as people gather in churches this weekend, not just here in this church, but in all churches across the world, there's all kinds of different people that are gathering you know, the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ is, is a place where His people get together to minister to Him and to praise Him and to bless Him and to pray to Him and have Him sing over them and have His power manifest there and they can experience His presence and all those things. But I understand that not everybody in the church is a Christian. I know that there's all kinds of people. There's people that are maybe even here tonight that are investigating right? Just investigating, just kind of curious about Jesus. Maybe your life wasn't all that it should be and you sensed, even though you don't have any like theology to figure it out, but you just kind of sense inside of you that it's not all that it's supposed to be and you're just kind of curious because you met some people that are Christ followers and, and you see that even though they have some issues in life also, they seem to kind of get through it okay and you don't. And, 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 and maybe you knew someone like I did who had cancer and, and he loved Jesus, but he died. But he died with a smile on his face and in the hospital room, he was sharing with people about the love of Jesus Christ while he's dying of cancer at 46 years old. And you're like, what? That doesn't happen too, too often. And so maybe you're just kind of investigating and you're curious about this Jesus. That might be you here tonight. Maybe you're in the room and you absolutely love. This is a great place for you to clap. I just want to let you know that. This is, 
Maybe, maybe you're in here tonight and, well, hold on a second. Hold, hold, hold on. Wait up. Wait up. Wait for it. Wait for it. Maybe you're here tonight and you just absolutely love Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and, and maybe you love him so much and you look back on your life and you say, man, I, I like, I, I, people have done things to me and like here and there and they tick me off and I just cannot stand them. But yet you look at your life and you're like, think about this for a second. Like I do one or two things to you, Carlos, and it could kind of tick you off a little bit. But just think of like, Every single thing that we've all done wrong that hurt his feelings and disappointed him and let him down and rebelled against him and yet somehow he loves you and because of that you just feel like, I mean, I just want to be obedient to him. I just want to be obedient. What he says, I just want to do. When he says jump, I don't say how high. I start doing this. And as I'm jumping, I'm saying how high, Lord. I just love him so very much. Maybe that's you. I don't know. And maybe you're in this room and maybe that's who you used to be. That's common. Maybe that's who you used to be, but somewhere along the line that either one or two things happened. Either the Jesus that you constructed that's not real failed you and you got hurt and you said, I'm done with him. Or maybe one of the people that bear his name, Christ followers, they did something to hurt you, which is often... And you said, I'm done with the one that they call theirs. I'm done. I don't go to church anymore. I don't pray anymore. I don't do it. I don't do any of that stuff anymore. I used to, but now I'm not. I'm done. And that's common too. And so maybe you're here tonight or somewhere, maybe even watching online right now. You're not ready to go into the church, but you're giving Jesus another try. And we're so grateful that you would give him another try. So maybe... That's you. There's all kinds of different people. You know that there's supposedly 2.5 billion Christians on this earth right now. 2.5 billion. Now let's scale it back a little bit to our context here in America. There's 325 million people approximately in America. And about 70% of those Americans say that they are Christians. And so what that would mean is that approximately 227 million people in America are Christians. And you're in that group, I hope. And if you're not in that group, I'm not going to be shy. I'm going to give you the chance to be part of that group right here tonight. So, in our message series, Red Wall, Red Letter, Jesus Christ is preaching what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And so he's gone up onto a hill, a mountain. I've never been there. Some say it's big. Some think that there's a small mound just there in Israel that he, none of us were there. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. He goes up onto the mountain. He calls folks just like you and I, people that say that we're Christians. He calls us up onto the mountain into class to learn how to be a Christ follower, how to flourish in this life of 60, 70, 80, maybe even 90 years following him. But when you read this section of the Sermon on the Mount, which is chapter 7, verse 13 through 23, you realize that Jesus Christ knows that even though he's called you up onto the mountain like he has here tonight, he knows that many hear, but they don't listen. Many people confess, but they don't submit. Pastor Jay said it wonderfully on Wednesday night. He said, many confess, but often don't possess. Jesus Christ. And that's very, very true. And so the bottom line is this. Many people say that they are Christians. Many people even believe that they are Christians. But many people are deceived. And and I love you too much. You know, the scriptures say to care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. And so since since His Spirit drew you in here tonight, He's entrusted you to to me tonight at least, and so I love you too much to let you be deceived under my watch. What you do before, what you do later, I don't know, but here tonight, I want to make sure that you're not deceived. You know, Jesus had a brother, his name is James, and he wrote a book of the Bible, and in his book, he said the same thing. He said, don't just be 
hearers of the word, like I know Jesus' word is, is true and it's good and it's pleased the, the souls of countless billions of people over the generations, and I know that it's right, but I don't really follow it. James says, don't just hear the word of God, but to be doers of the word, lest you deceive yourself. So what is it? Joyce Myers says, if you hang out in a garage all day, that doesn't necessarily make you a car. Just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean that you are. Just because you believe the Bible is true doesn't mean that you are. And so we don't want you to be deceived. And so Jesus, in this section of Scripture here, in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, He speaks some very clear, very divisive, if you will, language, dividing between who is and who isn't. He's saying some people say they are, but you're not. And he's very, very bold about this. And so I'm going to preach his words here to you tonight. And this message and this section of Scripture more in particular is is going to probably stir up, it should, it should stir up maybe a little bit of doubt inside of you. Not not bad doubt, but good doubt. But if it, it stirs up doubt as to whether you're in relationship with God or not, proper relationship through His Son Jesus or not, And if it just stirs up doubt and it ends right there. And that's all that happens. That's epic failure. But if his words stir up your doubt to the point where you start to evaluate yourself and start thinking, "Mm, Jesus, search my heart. You need to check my motives. You need to check my perspective. You need to check my priorities. You need to check my relationship with you. You need to trust. uh, look at the trust that I have in you and see if if this doubt stirs up a little introspection and then God reveals something to you that's quite, you know, not right. There's a deficit there. There's a void there. There's a, a flaw there. Something's wrong there and it leads you to repentance and it leads you to some new choices here tonight, then that's a massive success. And everybody's good at, st- I know, everybody's good at standing still, right? Everybody's good at not doing anything. That's like really, really good at that. I mean, in our faith. I mean, we're not good at standing, we're, we're really good at, at just saying, okay, I'm okay. I used to read. I kind of know. I know the basics. I'm good. We're good in, in a lot of things in life of, of standing still. And don't you, don't you need people to come alongside and kick you in the pants once in a while and say, get going? We need that. And shouldn't that happen every single time that you come to church? Isn't that why you come to Revolution Church? Yeah, you know, here, here's, here's my life. Here's my, my philosophy, here's my perspective, here's my language, here's my goals, here's my motives, here's my standards, here's my everything. This is my resources available, and this is how I live, and this is how I talk. This is me. And here's the Word of God over here. And this is what God says about Him. And this is what God says about you. And this is what God says about your language. And this is what God says about your resources. And this is what God says about everything. And here's me, and here's Him, and we come together right here so we can be challenged by that, right? Isn't that why you come to church? See, we don't want to go to a church where every single time you go to the church, you go in and you're looking for a guy who's going to say everything you believe. Every single time he says something, yeah, I believe that, I believe that, he's good, he's good, he's good, he's good, he's good, he's good. Where's the learning in that? I want to be challenged when I go to church. When I am off for a month, I don't sit at home, I go to church. And I want to go to a church where someone comes with the hammer so he can challenge what I think and challenge what I think I know and drive me to the word of God so I can find out what the truth is because my eternity is in the balance. And that's what should happen every single time that you come to church. Not for some pep rally, not for some motivational speech, not how to make friends and influence people, not to hear about my vacation, but you came to Revolution Church, I hope, every time to hear the the word of the Lord preached. Because every single word of it is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. It is the word of God that he uses to equip us 
for every good work. It's the word of God that lights our path. It's the word of God that revives our soul. It's the word of God that brings joy to the heart. And it's only, someone say only. And it's only when we open the word, read the word, and do the word that we find success in both this life and in the life to come. It's in the challenge of God's word where true transformation occurs. You have to be challenged by it every single time you come. Listen, someone should be looking at this pulpit right now and screaming out, Preacher, would you please read God's word to me? Anyone? Please, please. Right, that's what we're here for. Okay, so let's do that. Red letters. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. Are you ready? Are you all there? Do you have God's word in front of you? Okay, awesome. Here we go. You can enter God's kingdom. Er, Stop. How about that? I'm ready to preach this thing tonight. I read that again this morning to prepare, and I read that. I went, what? Down with all the people that say, man, I can't believe that God does this and God does that. And, and, and there's only one way. How about looking back on your life and all the things that you've done wrong and even acknowledging that, there, that God has even made a way? How awesome is that, right? You, th- those words right there, you can enter, praise God for that, right? That's amazing reality, that we could enter the kingdom of God with all that we have done. That's incredible. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. Who thinks I'm going to play highway to hell right now? I've I've grown up since the beginning of the church. And I once did play that song. But I'm not going to play it tonight, although I want to. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. I'm so tired of hearing people say, well, if you do this or you do that, God throws you into hell. Put your eyes on God's word. And what does it say? Yeah. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. All of us are offered. All of us have the gate available. And many of us, unfortunately, choose the road to destruction. But But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. That should make you shudder. It never used to make me shudder until it started to make my wife shudder and now it makes me shudder. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. This idea of fruit is mentioned often in Scripture, but I love the New Living Translation in this text right here because it helps us understand what fruit is. It's not just a churchy word. You can understand them by the way they act. Can you pick... This is your chance to be involved in the sermon. Are you ready? Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? That was so bad right there. Let's try it again. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? No. How about figs from thistles? No. Awesome. A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. I'll mention a little bit of the stuff at the end, but that pretty much sums up his Sermon on the Mount. Kind of leaves you hanging, doesn't it? He's like, yeah, not everyone's getting in. See ya. So when I, was, when, when I was in seminary, one of the things that they teach you in the class when they teach you to preach, which is pretty worthless, but they teach you to not leave everybody hanging, 
You can kick them in the teeth, but you've got to give them a lifeline afterwards. Don't send them out of here without something to go on so they have hope, right? So I was thinking about that as I'm getting ready for this week, and I, but then all of a sudden I look back at my, my pastor, right, Jesus. What's he do? Leaves them hanging. I, I, you know, we got Easter coming, right? Talk about a cliffhanger. He's, <laughs> he's walking around. He's like, hey, follow me. They're following him. And all of a sudden, he dies. The king of kings, the one who's going to come and deliver them, all of a sudden, he goes up on a cross and dies and gets put in a grave. But then something happened, right? And, and he rises to new life. Like, that's awesome, but he, he left him hanging. And so I think that it's okay for me to do the same thing. I'm going to totally leave you hanging here tonight, but next week, we're going to start preaching through 1 John. We're going to see an answer to this, okay? So... I just want to start off by saying this. The Christian stats of 2.5 billion, they don't seem to match the Christ's statement of only a few ever find it. I found that to be very, like, that stirred me up. Like, whoa, that just doesn't match. Now, there's only, there's 2.5 billion supposedly right now. So how many were there 50 years ago? I don't know. How many were there a hundred years ago? How many people were Christ followers um, a thousand years? Like when you start adding up all the people who say they're Christians, it's a massive number in the billions. And when you look at what the Christ says, only a few ever find it. That kind of struck me as odd. I don't know if it strikes you as odd, but it struck me as odd. Now, certainly within the 2.5 right now, there are genuine, authentic Christ followers, they love Jesus, they put their hope in Jesus, they have a, they have a, 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 a renewed sense of, of passion for him daily, they, they enjoy the presence of God, they enjoy going into his house and worshiping him, they love his word, they love to obey him, they love to worship him, they love to serve him, they love to praise him, awesome. In the 2.5 there's definitely some of those people, some of them are, are hopefully in this room here tonight, but maybe... <clears throat> Inside the 2.5 billion are, well, man, my, my family's been, we've been Christians since way back. And, and, and I got baptized when I was a kid, and, and, I, and, and, and I go to church, and I said the sinner's prayer. I said the sinner's prayer. Has anyone ever heard of the sinner's prayer? Raise your hand if you've heard of the sinner's prayer. Do, do, you, do you know what the sinner's prayer is? It doesn't exist. It doesn't. Go online and look it up. There's like 40 of them. It's, it's not biblical. It's not something out of the scriptures. It's not, it's not what Jesus says to do. It's just something, and Jay, he actually enlightened us on Wednesday night too. It's something that when Billy Graham got together in his crusades, you know, he called down the people and they came like crazy, right? And so he wanted to give, and like he's not a church in town. So he wanted to give the people something they could say and then confess that Jesus is their Lord, and then hopefully plug into a local church when him and his team left town. So he came up with this thing, supposedly. But there's really no such thing as the sinner's prayer. But I said the sinner's prayer. I went to the altar. I believe in Jesus. I live up to the Ten Commandments. I walked the aisle. I knelt at the altar. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. Are you a Christian? Well, man, I, used to, I went to Sunday school all the time when I was a kid, and I'm the very, very famous one. I'm a good person. Let me ask you a question. Are any of those, other than the first one I mentioned, are they the narrow gate and the difficult road? John 10, 9 says, Yes, I, Jesus Christ, in red, yes, I am the gate. Those who come through me, though, I'm sorry, those who come in through me will be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the one and only gate and way to eternal life. You understand? Very, very clear, right? Okay. But, 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 and this is, listen, this is a non-denominational church. This is going to be a stirring night for some of you, and I'm giving you what I believe is absolute truth, and I want the grace to be able to do that just as I would for you. If the way to eternal life is simply, I believe in Jesus, why would he say that the road or the way is difficult? 
How difficult is that? Is that difficult? Do you know that in Matthew 8, 29, demons called Jesus the Son of God. They are acknowledging his deity. So they may not follow him in loving obedience, but they are believing in who he is. So, so, so if it's just believing in Jesus, as some would say, is that a difficult or hard way? You might start wondering, like, well, then, if, 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 if I can't, like, how do I get in? Am I even, am I saved? <laughs> Who is saved? Like, who's saved? I mean, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe Mimi for sure. Like, she goes to church all the time, right? She, she must be saved. And maybe, you know, this guy, he must be saved because he, he's always quoting Bible verses all the time. And he goes to church all the time for sure. And I, and I think that lady is over there because I heard her speaking in tongues or something. I, so they must be, and, and listen, not only that, but here's the, here's the, the this, is, this is a guarantee, right? If they get a Z88 sticker on their car, they are heaven bound, right? <laughs> they, are, they, are, they are gone for glory. They're, they might even be there already. For sure, right? But listen, listen, listen. What, what does Jesus say here about who gets in? He said, only those who actually do the will of my Father. Okay? That, to me, is beyond believing in Jesus. Out of the words of the Savior who you are trusting for eternity, He said, only those who actually do the will of my Father will get in. Does that mean perfection? Well, we know that that is not the case too because it says in Scripture, all of us fail in many ways. But shouldn't there at least be, since God is the one who sees the heart and we see the outside and He knows what's going on inside here, shouldn't there at least be an increasing desire and passion for God? Shouldn't there be an increasing pattern of holiness, a little more Christ-like character being displayed in us each and every day? A little bit more evidence of obedience to Christ as we progress. Are you the same person you are from five years ago? Are you different now than you were last month? We should be increasing in our Christ-likeness. More fruit of the character of Christ being developed in us every day. More passion for the Word. More passion for the lost. More, <clears throat> more passion for generosity. More and more and more. Just like the song says, I want more of you. Why? So I can be more like you. That's what he wants. And so just because a person is appearing religious... Just because a person is displaying signs of a spiritual gift, just because someone is a deacon or a deaconess in a church, right? <clears throat> Look at it says here in verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Prophets. And a prophet is of the highest order. They speak for God. They're not just someone who's serving in the church in some other capacity. The prophet or the prophetess speaks for God. I haven't been doing this a long time, but in my life I've seen just it, like not even a week goes by where it's this prophet, that prophetess, this prophet. Everyone's a prophet. Everyone's a, 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 everyone's a pastor. Everyone's an apostle. Everyone's a prophet. It's just so much. It's so prevalent. Like, I'm not saying that there aren't. I'm just saying, like, everyone? He says, be, be careful. I got some information here about a prophet. Because you have to be careful. Because not every voice is the voice of God, is it? You got to be careful. And, and listen, I, I'm not a... I'm not a prophet in, its, in a biblical sense. I can speak on behalf of what's already said here, a prophetic gifting, if you will, but I'm not a prophet of God. Let me tell you why I'm not a prophet of God. Let's hear what the Word of God says. This is Deuteronomy 18.22. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously do not be afraid of him. So when that person comes up to you and says, Thus saith the Lord, you can go, Yeah, whatever. You gotta be careful, okay? Jeremiah 28 9. But the prophet who prophesies peace, 
will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. Being a prophet, is, there's a high standard to be a prophet of God. Ezekiel 33, 33. When all this comes true, and it surely will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And last but not least, 1 Samuel 3, 19. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. That means everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested, proven as a prophet of the Lord. I just say this, that a prophet of God is always correct if he's speaking the correct words of God. And so Jesus says, beware of false prophets. We can't just judge a book by its cover just because it looks religious, just because they spot out some Bible verses. We need to check the results. We need to check their actions. Actions speak louder than words. Practice what you preach. You may look like one thing, but your life is another. So what does it say? They're disguised. There's a mask. It looks this way, but a look at their life. Because he's talking a lot about fruit here, right? He's looking at their life. What does their life say? Not just what their words say. They become disguised. And the warning here, this is not to the blatant sinner. This is not to the atheist. This is not to the reckless one who's off doing crazy drugs and doing all these blatant sinful patterns. This is a warning to the religious that are under the facade. And underneath that mask, underneath that disguise, often there's greed and selfishness and pride and a foul mouth and a self-righteousness, immorality, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. You know, Jesus, he's got a thing against hypocrisy. He's got a thing against the pharisaical attitude that says, I am holy, but I'm really not. If you ever get a chance, this is an awesome book, I just want to let you know this. If you ever get a chance and you'd like to, to, to dig out some of the hypocrisy in your life, there's a book called Pharisectomy. Some of us need to, to have a Pharisectomy. And the, the, the book, I read it, it as about, oh, 10 years ago almost, but it was a guy named Peter Haas, and he wrote a book called Pharisectomy and digging out the inner Pharisee that's in all of us. It's not easy to read because it's going to speak to you about things that are wrong with you. And it'll help you get better. But you see here in the scripture, it tells us that just as the tree determines the fruit, like this type of tree gets this type of fruit. So he's talking about the person, right? Just as the tree determines the fruit, so too does the fruit identify the tree. And it's like that for us too. When we see the way we live, forget your title, Forget your self-proclaimed title. Let's look at your life and see what you, how you're living. And that's going to determine whether you really are a Christ follower or not. And so when you look at the tree and you know that he's talking about you and me, you got to look at verse 19 and it should alarm you a little bit. Look at verse 19 in the text. He says, um, So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Now, Jesus isn't always completely like clear about what he's trying to say. And so when we read this, we all have to draw some conclusion because we weren't there, right? This is a long time ago. But I don't know about you, and I'm, so again, non-denominational church, I have my own opinion about this, Based on everything that I've read in the Bible, I have a feeling about this fire thing. And it frightens me. It bothers me. And I think it should bother you too. I think it should bother you too. When you think about fire, what does it make you think about? Hell. Yeah. Like, is that what Jesus is saying? Well... He didn't say hell. He said fire. We have to draw some conclusion here. He said, Every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into 
the fire. Now, when I read that, I don't know if it makes you think about that. It made me think quickly about John chapter 15. Would you do me a favor? Would you go there in your Bibles? And let's kind of look at a couple different areas of Scripture here because we need to get our life right and be ready to meet the Lord whenever He decides to come, okay? That's super important. I want to make sure, again, under my watch, that you're loved well. I want to bring you into the Word of God, let you make some conclusions here. So we, we see in John chapter 15 some similar um, terminology here used by the same person. This is Jesus talking, okay? So this is what he says. You guys all there? Okay, so he says this. And this is going to be challenging, like I said earlier. It's going to be challenging to some of your theology. And I would only ask that you just listen to it, take some good notes, and go back and check the Scriptures to see if this is true. And if it's not true, you can come and we can talk about it. That's awesome. I'm not going to hold you and make you be a replica of me. This is what I see here, and I'm sharing it with you because I love you. Okay, And I think it's super important. Jesus said... <clears throat> I am the true grapevine. So just, imagine, just use your imagination. He's the, he's the actual plant, if you will. He's, just, he's obviously not a plant, but let's just say he's the plant. And my father, the father, you know, the father in heaven, he's the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Some Bibles will say abide, which is the same thing as remain. That means stay where you are. Okay, So stay where you are in me. And if you do, I will stay where I am in you. That's what it means. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is, if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me yes i am the vine you are the branches so we see our position here he's the actual plant and we're the branches on the plant but he's the main stock that's where the power is that's where the origin is that's where the nutrients are that's the identity that's who it is this is him and we're just the branches off of that you guys all know your position right okay those this is some qualifiers those who abide or those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is, this is the part. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned." Very familiar text right there. That sounds very, very much like what we just read in the book of Matthew. If we don't produce fruit, we get cut off and put into the fire. Now, when you realize 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in me, okay, in me, if anyone is in me, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold, I can see, a new man, a new woman. Okay, so that's, the de that's what a Christian is. If anyone is in Christ, then they're a Christian. Do you guys get this? Okay, so if anyone who's in me is a Christian, now we look at what Jesus said, if, anyone, if any one of mine doesn't produce fruit, they're cut off and thrown into a fire. And so some people, again, this is me, some people teach, well, they were never saved. If they're mine, <laughs> how do you say that they weren't saved? Jesus said, anyone of mine that does not produce fruit, my Father will cut them off and throw them into the fire. This is scary stuff. Like, I grew up, I, I, I grew up as a Christian. You know, I didn't grow up a Christian, but I... When I became a Christian, I, did, I, I was in a Baptist church. They would throw me out right now. But this clearly says, out of the words of Jesus Christ, out of his mouth, anyone of mine that does not produce fruit, the Father cuts me off and throws me into the fire. Now, you can believe what you want because that's up to you. 
But I'm just saying, if you're going to put your trust and hope in Jesus Christ, you, you heard what he said. Now, what you believe that means, that's up to you. But I'm telling you what I believe as your pastor. I believe that means that if you're in him, you're a Christian. But while you're in him, if you don't begin to produce fruit, severed, gone, done. I believe that because I believe this is extremely clear out of his mouth. Okay? You don't have to agree with me. You're not trying to produce Moses clones. I just want you to seriously consider these texts because your eternity is in the balance. Okay? Now, as Jesus continues to preach here, the gate gets more and more narrow and the road seems to get more and more difficult to get there and stay there. For years, the church has taught with the Roman's road. This is how to be saved, okay? The Roman's road is verses out of the book of Romans that Paul speaks and writes that tell us things like, you're a sinner because of this. And so we talk about this being the reason why you need salvation. And we go through these verses saying, okay, you're a sinner because of this. You need a Savior because of this. You can't do it on your own because of this. And Jesus Christ is the one. And so if you put your faith in Him, and so it all concludes always with Romans 10, 13, which says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which is awesome truth. It is truth. It is truth because it's in the Bible. I'm a sinner. I can't fix this. Jesus, I need you. It's the sinner's prayer, right? It's the sinner's prayer. Listen, 21 and 23 again. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord. Not, all that, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On Judgment Day, you all know about Judgment Day? You know this day coming, you have to stand before the one who created you and give an account for your life. You understand that, right? On Judgment Day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, and perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. These people were performing miracles in Jesus' name. They weren't pew sitters. They were casting out demons in Jesus' name. They were performing miracles in Jesus' name. Well, maybe they were, maybe they were casting out demons in, in, in Satan's power. That's, I hear that a lot. They said that of him. Well, Jesus himself in Matthew 12, 26, he teaches us that Satan doesn't cast out Satan. Right? So if the power isn't evil, then where's that power to cast out demons? Where's the power to prophesy? Where's that power to perform miracles in Jesus' name? Where's that coming from? The Holy Spirit. If it's not evil, it's got to be coming from somewhere, right? There, was some re there were results. We actually cast out demons in your name. So the demons were, they didn't say we tried to, we did. We did perform miracles in your name. So if it's not coming from Satan, it's got to, that power has got to be coming from somewhere. It was coming from God. It was coming from the Holy Spirit. So what I'm, what I'm thinking here, when I'm reading this, I think it's quite clear that something is required, according to Jesus, to ensure entrance into the kingdom of heaven. It's not just doing those things. Something's required. What's required? Well, you read it. Doing the will of the Father. Obeying God's laws. We don't need to obey God's laws anymore because we're under grace. You hear that a lot too. But the, the one that's saving us, right out of his mouth, he said only the ones who obey God's laws get into, get into heaven. So you got to, I'm just saying this, you have to do something with that. You can't just sweep it under the rug and say, I'm under grace. So I... I, I I don't need to because the one whose grace you received just told you the ones who get into heaven are the ones who do the will of the Father, the ones who keep my laws. He said, if you love me, you, you follow my commandments, right? That's what Jesus said. So I want to say this too. 
They're exercising these spiritual gifts, these people. And a spiritual gift is given, according to the scripture, a spiritual gift is given at the moment of salvation. When you say yes to Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit, and believers get a, at least one spiritual gift. Well, Christians argue about that. I'm not getting into that fray, that shark tank of how many gifts you get. But I know this, you all get at least one, right? You get one at salvation. It can be exercised only if given. Do you believe that? It can't be exercised if you, can't, if you don't have it, right? It gets exercised only if it's given. And even after receiving it, and even after exercising it, apparently entrance isn't guaranteed. <laughs> That's what I see there. I don't know if I'm crazy. Well, I know I'm crazy. But I don't know if I'm crazy on this. But I just see these guys prophesying in his name, casting out demons in his name, performing miracle, miracles in his name. 1 Corinthians 12 says that prophecy and miracles are spiritual gifts. In Acts 16, Paul cast out the, a demon in the name of Jesus Christ. In Mark 16, 17, it says, These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. Right? This is not a power of the devil that casts out demons. This is the power of the Holy Spirit casting out demons. And these people are not getting in. You've got to do something with that, man. It should make you shudder. It should make you shudder. <clears throat> I wrote down in my Bible here, your gifting will never override your disobedience. That's what I wrote down. Your gifting will never override your disobedience. Okay, so this is going to get even worse for you, some of you, because it's going to challenge your theology. Not every Christian is going to agree with me, but I just say this. Here in Matthew 7, and then also in John 15, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is teaching about the person who has a season of obedience who has a season of walking with the Lord, has a season of walking in His power, in His presence, exercising the gift, exercising His power, and then for one reason or another, something happens and it changes. The scripture talks about apostasy. It means the renunci renouncing of our faith. And when Jesus says the road, or your, your translation might say the way to life is difficult, I believe he means it's tough to maintain a life of persevering, obedient submission to God. And, and I believe, let me see, that, this, it, this should be a picture up there of a gate. Do you have a picture on that computer of a gate? Okay. Don't worry about the little puppy there, okay. But it's a cute little puppy. Okay, let's get our eyes off the puppy, though. See, I noticed something about a gate in my study over the last couple weeks. I noticed something about the gate. Notice when Jesus says about the, the, the road and the gate. I realize that, that there's a road that leads to the gate. And then there's the gate. But then on the other side of the gate is the final destination. You see it up there, that... You know, there's a palace being built for you in heaven right now, right? It's getting prepared, right? So that's what this picture is, kind of. It's going to be better than I believe. But that place is pretty nice in the meantime. But I think it's a good depiction of what we are facing. We have a road that leads to Jesus. How many people realize that their road to Jesus was hell, right? <laughs> Mine was. It was living hell. And, but, I, but I finally, I got there. Praise God, I got there. And so I got to the gate. But after I got through the gate, I still had a road to, to travel, didn't I? I still have a road to travel until I get to my final destination in glory. And if it's off in some heaven somewhere, awesome. If it's here as a new heaven and a new earth and paradise is here, we can all fight about that too. I know one thing, I want to be there. And I'm not there yet, right? When we bent our knee to Jesus, we got saved. And then after that, before you die, you're getting saved. And then one day you're going to be saved, right? And so there's a path that's beyond the gate, there's a path beyond the gate. So it's road, gate, and road. 
And I want to just love you well and tell you that the road to everlasting life doesn't end at the gate. I believe it begins at the gate. That's what I believe. I believe that the road to get to the gate can be absolutely brutal. And, and, and probably most of us have walked that brutal road for years of self-destruction over and over and over again like a stupid cat that chases its tail, one bad choice after another, never getting anywhere, constant pain, constant torment, I can't take it anymore, and then Jesus invades your life, and that's the gate. And you gave your life to him, and you begin this new relationship with him. But after you pass through the gate, right, if you're a Christian now, you know that the road after the gate, sometimes it's worse. Right? It's awesome because you, you got God on your side, but sometimes it's worse. Right? In this life, you will have trouble. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. I mean, it's just what happens, right? The, the preacher that says everything's going to be better if you give your life to Christ, they're lying. It's not always... Peaches and cream, and puppy dogs and rainbows and bunny rabbits and stuff. It's not like that. It's hard. It's hard. So when he says that the, the gate is narrow, yeah, we get that. It's only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ. But the, the road is difficult. It is difficult. Because he said only those who do the will of the Father and obey the laws get in. How many people think that's easy? I didn't think there'd be too many hands going up because it's not easy. How many people think it's easy to fight the temptations that come at them now that they know that they're wrong and before it was so easy to give yourself to it but now it's like, I know I shouldn't but I want to, right? But you don't and it's hard to say no to those things, isn't it? And, and, and isn't it hard when, 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 when the Bible says to do certain things and you don't want to? And isn't it hard when, when stubborn people come walking through the room and asking you to give to the, to the kingdom of God and you don't want to let go? And isn't it hard when Karen gets up and says, I want you to give more of your time that you already don't have to serve Jesus? Isn't it hard? Isn't it hard when you want to be a Christ follower in America and everyone tells you you're stupid and shallow and, and closed-minded and you're a bigot and you're this and you're that and, you're, and, you're, and your words are full of hate and don't tell me what to do and all that. Isn't it hard? I think it's really, really hard. I think the road after the gate is sometimes more difficult than the road before the gate because the road before the gate, you, sometimes you didn't even know you were doing wrong and didn't care. But now you do. And so when you do something wrong, that's difficult too because now you feel it. Thank God, 1 John 1, 9, those who confess their sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive them of their sin and cleanse them from all wickedness. It's awesome truth. But life is very, very hard after the gate. 1 Peter 4, 12, Peter says, Dear friends, don't be surprised by the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. It's going to be difficult once you get through the gate. Once you say yes to Jesus, it's not like, oh, I've done it, I'm good now. It's not that easy. Staying on the path with Jesus, abiding in Him, remaining in Him is difficult. Many don't ever find it, and many stray once they do. I could probably take a poll in this room and Probably most of us could tell one person at least, and we don't know a person's heart, only God does. But we can, most of us probably list someone that we knew. Man, he used to walk with the Lord, and he just loved the Lord. And, and she used to praise him, and she used to sing his songs, and she used to come to church all the time, and she had such a great smile, and she just loved Jesus. And, and you're just so sad because now she or he are not doing that at all anymore. And they're off doing things that are unmentionable. And it breaks your heart. I can only imagine it breaks God's heart as well. But he says, not all that call Jesus Lord will be in heaven. And this fact should inspire in each of us a healthy examination, a healthy inventory of our heart. An inventory, an examination of our motives, our trust, our obedience our submission 
to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You've got to ask yourself tonight, have you ever really reached out and grasped eternal life by accepting Jesus Christ as my one and only gate into everlasting glory? Have you ever made that choice honestly to adopt a lifestyle of obedience to God's Word? I wonder. It's like the most important choice of your life. But here's the deal. When I say, have you grasped Jesus Christ as your one and only? See, the scriptures tell us something, and you've got to heed this. In Acts 2.36, Peter said this when the church first gets started. He said, God has made this Jesus both Lord, what's that mean? Boss, leader, reason, king, right? He says, do something, you do it. That's Lord. God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. What's Messiah? The deliverer, right? He's the, that's the Jesus that went on the cross to pay for your sins so you could be paid for, so you could have glory, right? That's the, that's the Messiah aspect of Jesus. But Peter says in Scripture that God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah. So believing in Jesus takes on two looks. And you have to have both. You can't have one without the other. You can't say he's my Savior who went to the cross to pay for my sin. That may be true. And that's awesome. But if you say you believe in Jesus and you've reached out and grabbed hold of everlasting life with a true Jesus, that Jesus is also Lord. And he said only those who do the will of the Father get in. Just saying he went to pay for my sin ain't going to get it. Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. So we can't just make the mistake of simply looking back to that day or even to that season of thanksgiving for what he's done and obedience to his word and say, that's enough. Can't do that. God doesn't give you the choice to do that. He doesn't give you the option to do that and still call him your Lord and Savior. As a matter of fact, I kind of close with this. Colossians 2.6 says this, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, your boss, your leader, your reason, your king, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. That doesn't mean, so you must follow Him today. Just as you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today. Let's say today is the day you get saved. Let's say right now I say, do you want it? And you go, oh yes, I want Jesus. So that's awesome. Guess what? Tomorrow you got to do the same thing. If you're following the Spirit's leading right now to give your life to Christ, you have to follow His leading to do whatever Christ says to do tomorrow, the next day, and for the rest of your breath. That's Lordship. That's who Jesus is. You can't accept Him as, as Savior, but not Lord. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. So I just say this. I think the gate that He speaks of is the accepting part. That's when you accept Him. And that's when you say, yes, I'm in. But I think the continue is the road. That's the road. You, you, the road doesn't end at the gate. That just gets you in. And now, that rest of the path between the gate and the castle, that's the rest of your life. And that road is difficult. But he demands obedience or else what happens? Whoosh, into the fire. That's just what the Bible says. I don't like it. If I was writing my own book, it wouldn't be in there. But that's what it says, and I can't deny it. So, I said earlier, as we would mention some of the stuff at the end and be done. Verse 24 is awesome. 
But before we read that, this is the part of the Sermon on the Mount where it ends. And Jesus is talking about this house that gets built. And one house is going to stand firm forever. It doesn't say the house doesn't get built. I think that's got some meaning too. The house in both cases gets built. One house gets built on, on one thing, and one house gets built on another. And then life comes to both houses. Right? The house is established. And again, Jesus is giving an example here. He's, 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 he's talking about people. The houses get built. One collapses when life happens, and one stands firm. And which is the one that stands firm? Look at verse 24. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it. It's the same thing that James said. Don't just be hearers, but be doers, unless you deceive yourself. Jesus said, don't just hear what I'm saying to you today. You need to do what I'm telling you today, or else when life comes, the house crashes. And I love you too much to see your house crash, to see you crash and end up in a bad, bad place. So, Tom, would you come up and fill this room with some sweet sound? And I want to take a few moments and I want to pray with you. I'm just going to kind of leave, leave you hanging right there. I don't know if you feel confident in your salvation tonight or not. I don't know. I know that when... I, I mean, I'm the pastor of this church. I graduated seminary, and I've been doing this now for since, I don't know, 2004, 2005. So, like, certainly I should be saved, but when I read this stuff, it makes me stop and think, like, hey, maybe there's some void. Maybe there's some valley. Maybe there's some separation. Maybe there's some error. Maybe there's some problem here. Because not everybody who calls on Jesus' name and says, Jesus, you're my Lord. Not everyone gets in. Not even the pastor necessarily. You know, I'm sure that there's many pastors that have lived and will live that will not be in glory. I, 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 I want to be that. I want to be there. I hope that you want me to be there. I want you to be there. I want every single one of you to be there so bad more than anything in the world. <clears throat> you know, pray for me I know that Paul said that he would be willing to be forever cursed if his people would find salvation I haven't got there yet <laughs> but I'd like to be there I'd be willing to go to hell forever if you guys could go to heaven that's awesome that's really putting other people before yourself but I have, I have some work to do but I don't know I would just read this text and it just makes me think like am I I mean did, did I just go to church did I just go through the motions or am I really genuinely, like Jesus said, doing the will of the Father? Am I, am I opening up God's word, reading what it says and just doing it and trusting that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose? Doing this stuff, trusting it's going to work out for the best. See, that's the Lordship of Christ. When he says do something, we do it. And I think churches are filled with people who do not. But I don't want this church to be that church. If this church never grew larger, but all of you were doing this, we're on it right here, just absolutely loving the Lord, and if you love me, you keep my commands. <laughs> if you were all doing that, man, I could just, I know I could go to glory, and he'd say, well done. If you guys were doing that, awesome. So, pray with me. Father God, I... Um, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's true. I thank you, Lord, that, um, Jesus, that you didn't sugarcoat things. I'm thankful, Lord, that you told us the truth. I thank you, Lord, that you... I, I really thank you, Lord, for, for sometimes not being so clear so that it makes us pursue you. Like, if, 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 if branches that don't produce fruit are cut off but you don't give the specifics, that just drives us, Lord, to want to obey you, to pursue you with our whole heart. And sometimes I know that being a dad, sometimes when you tell a child what they need to do to get blessed, the motive is wrong. 
because they're only doing it to get the blessing. They're not doing it to show honor to the Father. And Lord, we don't want to be those children. We want to be the children that we don't worry about getting lopped off because we are in such hot pursuit of you every day of our life that we are never in jeopardy of this, if it be true. Lord, I would ask that you would help us to bear much fruit. I ask you, Lord, that we would be empowered by your Spirit to prophesy, empowered by your Spirit to cast out demons, empowered by your Spirit to do miracles, but also that we would say, Lord, Lord, and you'd say, come on in. That's who we want to be. So, Father, I pray that you would help us take a few moments here now to let your Holy Spirit that is inside of us to begin to examine our heart. Are we truly saved, Lord? Am I truly saved? Is there something blocking that? You said only a few, only a very few, find it. Only a very few find it. Well, it just seems to me that 2.5 is not very few. 2.5 billion people, that's not very few. So where we don't want to base our salvation on our feelings or on statistics. I want to base it on your word. So search our hearts now. Join us right now inside and point out deficit. Point out void. Point out error. Point out complacency. Point out lethargy. Point out sin. And grant us repentance of these things that you point out. us to make better choices starting now.